Good morning and welcome to Behind the Scene, a show where we just hang out and we talk about games, gaming, things that we uh, love in the game arena. Role-playing games, board games, card games, video games, that sort of things, but specifically focused on things that are beautiful and interesting. Things that have intrinsic value that we can look at and um, see how it can enrich our lives by it uh, being a part of them. And today we're continuing our discussion on Wrath and Glory, which again, for a game about the grim darkness of the 42nd millennium, is a pretty beautiful game and has moments of intense heroism in the face of nihilism, which is something I really enjoy about heroes in cosmic horror, which I would argue 40k has a lot of cosmic horror in it. But First of all, good morning to Padre and John and Tink and Grom. Yes, I am really, really excited about um, doing a Lost Colony and Maw of Oblivion review. Can't wait for that. That's going to happen in about two weeks, the start of October. Got a whole plan for October. Got a whole plan for December. And then, as I said, we're going to be making some changes to the Patreon, Discord, focus of the show coming up in January. So... We'll talk more about that probably in December. Looking forward to getting some more interviews going on. But anyway, let's talk about Wrath and Glory. So, one of the problems with Wrath and Glory is... 40k is a huge setting. Even if you cut it in half because of the Great Rift, you're still left with half the galaxy. So, what do you do in a 40k game. D&D has a very simple premise. A group of itinerant adventurers are going out to um, save the world, clear out the dungeon, strike a blow for law and good in the face of chaos and evil. Jackals has a very similar premise. A group of itinerant uh, Wanderers with no family become a family to themselves and push back chaos, keeping the you know, points of light of the civilization burning bright. Call of Cthulhu. Very simple. What is the core activity? We're going to investigate elder horrors until we go crazy or die. But 40k, you have an entire galaxy. Even just focusing on the Gilead system, you have between 5 and 7 planets to work on. And when you look at the character options, which we'll do um, on Tuesday, you have everything from human gangers all the way up to the superhuman Primaris Marines, as well as orcs and Eldari. There's a lot going on here. And so how the design of this game helps narrow that choice is through factions and frameworks. So we're going to talk a little bit about these. And I've got to explain a little bit more about the mechanics of Wrath and Glory, but I think it is a brilliant way to handle a setting that is a very sandbox setting. I think for uh, we can take a lot of ideas from this as GMs and game designers in how they focus the mechanics of the game toward narrowing the scope of play. So, all of the uh, factions, in fact, a lot of the species as well, the game has a lot of, uh, is keyword driven. So when a keyword works in your favor, you get a benefit. When a keyword works in your detriment, you take a penalty. Um, so you may have Adaptus Astartes as a keyword, or Orc, or Sister of Battle. Um, Imperium, Chaos. You may have these different keywords, and it's a shorthand for GMs to say, okay, uh, this character, uh, they hate the Imperium. So if you have the Imperium keyword, they're automatically unfriendly to you. It's pretty simple. But it doesn't help narrow us anymore. And so we're going to talk about the factions that are presented in this book. Because by aligning with a faction... It helps narrow down this large, expansive universe to play in. And the factions which drive this keyword mechanic in this game are... There's a lot of them. And to say 
that they may be the core of the setting, I don't think is too far off. Because, so we talked about the Gilead system. It's like 15 pages. The faction discussion is over 30. So just by word count, we can see where the game is placing its weight. That's one of the secrets, I think, of game design. If you want to know what's important in a game, see what it's dedicating the most space to. Magic is very important in Dungeons and Dragons. But also, combat is very important to Dungeons and Dragons. More so than the other two pillars, especially just looking at the core rulebook. Magic and combat take up half of that book. Exploration and the social pillar take up maybe a page and a half each. Alright, so the factions of the Imperium and the Gilead system are the Adaptus Sororitas, the Sisters of Battle. They are a militant branch of the Imperium uh, that is composed entirely of warrior nuns dedicated to the Emperor. The Adaptus Astra Telepathica. These are the telepaths who go out, they actually hunt psychers, and they were used to be in charge of bringing those psychers on the black ships to the Golden Throne, but uh, Terra is cut off from the Gilead system. The Adaptus uh, Ministrorum is the uh, bureaucracy. They're the, uh, the civil authority in the Gilead system. Their job is to keep everything moving along and running until the Emperor's Light returns. The Astra Militarum is the Imperial Guard. They are the ones, they are the military, the vast uh, human boots on the ground military, uh, the army of the Imperium. There's the Inquisition faction, um, which is the faction of the church that hunts down, um, depending on their uh, their ordo, either the heretic, the demon, or the alien. Yes, Padre, that is a great point. The Ecclesiarchy can't have any men under arms, so they have armed the Sisters of Battle. Uh, so you have the Ordo Hereticus, uh, which uh, hunt down are witch hunters. They hunt down mutants and psychers and heretics. The Ordo Xenos hunt aliens, and the Ordo Malus, Malleus hunt demons. So that's another faction in this uh, setting. I promise I'm getting to how this narrows it down. You have the Rogue Trader dynasties. These are imperial privateers who have obscure and ancient contracts that go back to the founding of the Imperium of Man that allow them to do certain things and take on certain tasks. I think for me, the Rogue Trader Dynasty has the uh, most flexibility of the factions because depending on their charter, they may not care if you're an Eldari or an Orc. If you can help them fulfill the charter, that's all they care about. You have Scum. There is a massive criminal element. Um... Hive worlds are wretched hives of scum and villainy. So you could play a group of gangers in the middle of a war, gang war, in, on a level of a hive world. Of course, you have the Adaptus Astartes, the Space Marines, uh, the Emperor's Angels. And then we get into the, uh, the last three factions. You have the Eldari, uh, Corsairs, Craft Worlds, and Dark Eldar. You have Orcs. And then you have Chaos. Yeah, they allow you to play Chaos in the in this game. Alright, so you may be sitting there going, JM, you have yet to actually help me narrow this game down. Because now I have everything from the massive Imperium to playing as Orcs to playing as uh, Space Elves to playing as Chaos, something completely antithetical to uh, the rest of the set. Yes. So that brings us to frameworks. So a framework is a way to narrow down the game. They're usually tied to a faction or a patron, and they give you enough examples spread out over 
the core rulebook, redacted records, and Church of Steel to come up with your own. I think, in fact, in redacted records, they have you know ways of coming up with your own frameworks. And so a framework just says, hey, guys, here's the game we're going to play. Maybe the players say, uh, you know what, after explaining all of this to us, we really think that playing, like, the Imperial Guard would be a ton of fun. And so we're going to play an Imperial Guard game. All right, well, that helps us pick our tier of power between one and five. One being um, a lowly human ganger. Five being, again, a Primaris Marine in power. So they pick our tier, gives us a focus for our game. So, for example, one of these... Uh, frameworks in the core book is tied to the rogue trader dynasties. The framework is uh, Veronius's vanguard, Veronius being um, the rogue trader. Volunteers, mercenaries, conscript, conscripts to the flotilla, you are a discreet problem solving force. Though usually sent to the fringes of Gilead to find allies or resources, you may be called to the heart worlds when a problem confounds local authorities or the flotilla has special interest in the proceedings on a certain world. So each framework has three parts to it. One, it's got a limitation, and this is based off keywords. So for this one, it says any character with the Imperium keyword is allowed in this framework and possibly a discreet Aldari mercenary. No chaos. No orcs. No one with the heretical keyword. So one, we've limited the choices by keyword. Then we've given a... Uh, it comes with war gear. Every member of this group, for example, receives um, a curriculum kit and a symbol of authority, marking them as an agent of the flotilla. So you have a limitation. You have some equipment that ties the group together. And then everyone gets a bonus. So every one of this framework gets a plus one to influence tests when requesting war gear from the fleet. So that's how they do it. Between keywords, factions, and frameworks, that's how they limit the scope of this game. So as the GM, you may be reading through this and go, hey, I want to run lit Litanies of the Lost, which is a short group of linked adventures. And there's some frameworks in here, so we're going to just pick one of those, and I'm going to tell my group, hey, everybody, here are the keywords we're restricting, here is the uh, war gear benefit, here's the bonus you all get. Or the players can come up with a goal. Maybe the players are like, hey, we really want to play members of the Inquisition hunting down um, Xenos throughout, uh, Xenos threats throughout uh, the Gilead system. Okay, well, the GM then can create a new framework based around that. And I would say Redacted Records is definitely worth getting. First of all, I think, as I pointed out, it has all of the amazing Space Hulk uh, tables in here for just randomly rolling up new Space Hulks. But it also has new frameworks, and it has rules on creating frameworks. Let's see here. It has one, two, three, four... Oh, we're not even going to do that. It's got frameworks by faction, and it has six, seven, 17 pages of frameworks. It's enough to cover anything that you, you need to do. So why is this interesting? Well, we like a lot of games on this show. And a lot of games have a lot of different modes of play. Savage Worlds has as many opportunities as Wrath and Glory does. Heck, just take Deadlands. Look at all of the different character archetypes. Even D20 Fantasy has a lot of options now. Are we playing a Grimdark game? Are we playing a high fantasy, save the world plotline? Is it an intrigue game based off of Game of Thrones? Is it a... Uh, city-based sword and sorceries game. Coming up with a framework, and even stealing it straight out of Wrath and Glory, hey, here's what I'm restricting, here's what benefits you're getting from it gear-wise, and here's what mechanical benefits you're getting from it, 
really helps tie a group together. John Wick and Play Dirty talks about a game that he played in 3-5 where everyone had to take at least one level of Thief. That's a, a limitation. So suddenly now everybody's having to say, well, I'm now playing a Wizard with one level of Thief, or I'm playing a Paladin with one level of Thief. How does that change the nature of my character? Now, sometimes game systems are really great about this. I'm looking right at you, Savage Worlds. The Twilight Legion. The Tomorrow Legion for Rifts. These are built-in frameworks that just say, hey, here is a massive setting, and here's how we tie all of this together. I think that coming to the table and either asking the group what kind of framework, what kind of game do you want to play, or providing the group with several options, but also giving them mechanical and equipment reasons to buy into this framework is great. It's a way that generates buy-in immediately and sets everyone on the same page. Going to Wrath and Glory, if I'm playing, if I say, hey, we're going to play a, an Imperium game focused on the military, the ecclesiarchy, and the uh, Ministratum, Imperium keywords only, you don't get the guy who... You have, you have a clear a clear line of discussion, so the guy who wants to play the orc knob either has to come up with an amazing reason why they're going to work within these bounds, or you just say, no, sorry, Imperium keyword is out. It's the guy who, all, we've all, we, maybe we are, maybe you are that guy, I'm not trying to call you out, but the guy who in an L5R game wants to play the one Gaijin who is stuck in Rokugan. It's like, no, the framework of L5R is samurai in Rokugan. We're not going to play, you know, fish out of water. Um, so the reason that he did that was he was doing a game set in the City of Thieves. It was more of a renaissance game. And what was interesting was, and maybe he was playing in it. I don't really remember the story. i got to go back and read Play Dirty. It's almost time for my annual reread. But suddenly, his paladin was less of the heavily armored, you know, I'm going to you know, rush through this and lay hands, and far more of a swashbuckler who would gather their allies into their arms and give them a, uh, a, a word of encouragement or a, a longing gaze, and that is how he would uh, lay on hands, and then go climb down the wall or swing off a chandelier. Right, there's always the play of the unicorn clan. But even they fit within the, the framework of Rokugan. See, that's another way to do it, John. Uh, if we're going to go back to 3rd edition terms, that would be what? Uh, ECL? Give them an ECL of 1. Hey, you all get the equivalent of equivalent level of 1st uh, level Thief, but do whatever you want with it. Uh, I think Savage Worlds is great for this. It's... Between the setting rules and the archetypes, you get a really tight idea of what you're supposed to be doing in the game. I think some games suffer from this. Um, GURPS and Hero, which I love, really require the GM to come with a really strong idea of their world and the way they want to play. Some games are, hey, you can do whatever you want. And, I mean, that's great several books down from the start. I think the designers of Wrath and Glory understood this, and actually, I know they did, because one of the lead designers on the uh, Ulysses version of Wrath and Glory, the, the first edition of Wrath and Glory, is Ross Watson. Ross and I worked together on uh, several games, and Ross was the one who came up with those three things I told you. He was like, hey, I want to hear about your game, but if you can't answer... What are the player characters? What is their core activity? And what happens if they don't engage with it? You don't really have a game. You've got a setting, and maybe you have some rules, but that's really it. 
makes no it's no surprise to me that Ross helped create frameworks for Wrath and Glory to provide answers to those three things. So, let's see here. John said, in Savage Worlds, I just say everyone gets one of these two free edges from having been a thief and the wanted hindrance. Right, and then everybody gets a free thieves tool and um, you know, a plus one to thievery or a plus one to roles when interacting with the thieves guild um, because you have connections. Done. And I think that's, again, the beauty of Savage Worlds is that it's just that flexible. So I'm going to make sure I do this right. John, you can see I've got my Lost Colony box now uh, displayed uh, behind, behind me here. Right, make thievery a core skill. What's interesting to me is in lifting this, this framework rule out of Wrath and Glory, which I really love. Again, I turned to a, a favorite game of mine and went to Savage Worlds. and was like, how do I do this? Oh man, Savage Worlds has the most flexible way to just put all of this in place. Not only do they do it with their settings and setting rules, but they do it wonderfully with just how modular that game is. I think we've just established how uh, we're all going to uh, run this uh, Thieves game uh, set in a fantasy city in, in Savage Worlds. Core skills, your mechanical benefit, uh, along with edges. Uh, a little bit of gear, and then our limitations. Perfect. John, I'm really looking forward to playing in your Rise of the Rune Lords game. Um, Savage is just continually growing uh, uh, in my play space. A lot of my players at the table really love Savage. It's always great to be able to go back to that. I am building for, towards a massive Jackals campaign, but let's be honest, it's the game I wrote, so... Every time I play Jackals, I'm like, man, this does exactly everything I would want this a Bronze Age fantasy game to do. Oh, because, uh, you know, I, I wrote it for my play table, and it just ha so happens that other people enjoy it. But there's a there's definitely a Savage Pathfinder, Savage Fantasy companion, or even a Return to Crucible, uh, definitely in the books, kind of up ahead in the future. So that brings us to the end of our discussion on Wrath and Glory, and as always, i got to sneak a little Savage Worlds in there. Speaking of, I will be on Savage Universe stream tonight, uh, continuing our celebration of Swag Timber, the fifth, celebration, or fifth anniversary of the launch of the Savage Worlds Adventure Guild. That'll be at 6 o'clock Central, 7 o'clock Eastern. I think that's always the easier one to start with, 7 o'clock Eastern. I have a lot of guests that are going to be on the show tonight. I am really looking forward to to it. I would have to give Savage Worlds Jackals a really... I would have to figure out how I would do that. I may have to pick the brain of the Discord community on what they think the setting setting rules that would really make Savage Worlds Jackals worth looking into. 50 Fathoms. Um, I am still a really big fan of Evernight. Um, if I can get my hands... Or if they were to redo Evernight, I would just adore that. That was one of my favorite. Yeah. So, uh, that's it. Until next time. Uh, next On Tuesday, we're going to talk about what you can play in this game. Now that we know what you can, you know, what the focus of a campaign can be. What are our character options? What do we want to dig into? And we'll probably also touch on... Um, the Litanies of the Lost Adventure from um, next next week as well. Characters and the Litanies of the Lost Adventure. Then we're going to pause and go into Lost Colony, Maw of Oblivion, and then some horror-based uh, discussions, because it's October. Then we'll be back into Wrath and Glory. I plan on looking at the combat, psychic rules in November. And again, Malazan Christmas is coming up. And I kind of want to make that an annual event. So, until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, stay gaming. I am JM. This has been Behind the Screen, and I will see you all. Have a good one.